uh, delighted uh, that all of you have chosen to be with us uh, tonight, and thank you very much for your participation, particularly to, uh, to my students from uh, our nuclear weapons class for graduate students uh, that are, uh, have been asking through the course of the semester how to deal with the hard cases. Uh, Dr. Walsh has been dealing explicitly with the hardest of the hard cases uh, for several years. He is uh, engaged in Track 2 diplomacy, an effort by uh, non-governmental representatives such as Dr. Walsh to engage directly with the governments of Iran and North Korea to, uh, to understand what the near-term stumbling blocks are uh, in nonproliferation diplomacy and to seek their compliance with their international legal obligations for nonproliferation and, and to reestablish those more strongly. So, uh, his effort is extremely important uh, in the context of not only the global nonproliferation and disarmament regime, but more broadly efforts to control the spread of nuclear weapons and to promote international peace and security. <coughs> Dr. Walsh is, as I mentioned, a, uh, a research associate at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He's also been executive director of the Managing the Atom Project at Harvard University, which is a, uh, a one-of-a-kind, fascinating effort formerly led by the now uh, White House Science and Technology Policy Advisor, John Holdren, uh, to respond to the dangers, challenges, and opportunities of, of managing the atom, uh, and previously served as a visiting scholar at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Uh, he's appeared on almost every major news television show there is and has uh, placed uh, opinion pieces and other commentary in uh, the New York uh, Times, the New York Times Review of Books, uh, and a wide variety of other outlets, and, and is really a transformational thinker in how we deal with the hard cases. Uh, at the Elliott School, we're not just concerned about diplomacy and international affairs as an academic enterprise. We aim to make the world a better place. Uh, and it's in that context that we're really delighted to have Dr. Walsh here with us tonight to learn about how, how one can talk to the bad guys and face the hard cases. Please join me in walk, welcoming Dr. Jim Walsh. I, I think it just, uh, well, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I know I'm uh, obliged to say it's a pleasure to be here, uh, but I actually mean it. Uh, as you can tell, uh, Doug is a transformational figure. Uh, it's my great pleasure to know him as a colleague, uh, to learn from him, and, and to be here at his institution. You know, I was telling him before we started that uh, when I was a kid, I used to come to Washington and participated in things over at Georgetown, and Georgetown was like the only university. I mean, they, there were other universities, but Georgetown was the university then. Oh, oh, you know, I forgot this is being filmed. I should, I want to apologize to all my friends at Georgetown for anything I'm about to say. Uh, but you know, uh, things have changed. Uh, the landscape has changed, and GW has enjoyed a meteoric rise uh, in the last several years, and that's one that's been based on substantive academic work, real academic work, uh, and also innovation, and it's been a pleasure to watch. And I felt it personally this morning, this is no lie, this morning I was having breakfast with my daughter before I took her to school, and she asked, you know, what I was going to do in D.C., and I said, I'm going to go give a talk at GW, and she said, she's a uh, sophomore in high school, and she said she plans to apply to George Washington University. So it's even reached down into the Walsh household, uh, the degree to which uh, George Washington has become a, a pervasive and important uh, institution. Uh, and I like being here because uh, I'm often treated with respect, always treated with respect, and that's not always the case. And I just want to give you some, one short example here. Here's the advertisement for uh, the lecture. Uh, I'm not a big fan of orange, but I think this is a pretty good, uh, straightforward, respectful uh, advertisement for the lecture I'm about to give. Here is the advertisement for a lecture I gave. That is my head. I don't know if you can tell back there. <laughs> that's my head in a mushroom cloud. And, uh, you know, that's just disturbing. Uh, and uh, I hope no children saw that. So that is an actual poster from a previous talk I gave. Well, let me tell you what we're going to do in our short time together. Uh, we're going to talk, I, I want to sort of set the stage and uh, for talking more broadly about Iran's uh, nuclear weapons or nu uh, nuclear program and concerns about a nuclear weapons effort by t uh, sort of laying the groundwork and talk about Iran's general principles in, in, with respect to foreign and military policy. Uh, then I want to talk about their nuclear policy prior 
to the June 12th election, and because I think the June 12th election may be an important cleavage point in Iranian modern history, uh, at least for the Islamic Republic, I then want to talk about what I think uh, may be happening with respect to Iran's nuclear program after that June 12th election. Uh, take a quick tour of U.S. policy and an even briefer look at the way forward. Uh, on your right, you see what happens to people who listen to the entire talk, uh, but uh, on the other side, that's what you'll get if you fall asleep. I just warn you right now. <laughs> that's the claw. All right, well, let's get started. Let's talk a little bit. Let's set the stage and try to understand uh, Iran as Iran and uh, the factors that influence the Islamic Republic, whether it's nuclear policy or not. What, how are we to understand the history and evolution of their foreign and military policy? Well, I think right after the revolution, in that period between 79 and 1991, it was a revolutionary government. Uh, it wanted to export the revolution, uh, but it found uh, soon after having taken power that Saddam Hussein in Iraq invaded, and it had a bloody, uh, awful, uh, at the time, the largest uh, conflict in the region on record, uh, war that it had to contend with. And it had, at least back then, in the early years, the Soviet Union. We often talk about how the U.S and Iran are at odds, uh, but way back when in the old days, right across that Caspian Sea, that was the Soviet Union. What was the great power that posed the greatest military threat to Iran uh, in the early days right after the revolution? It was the Soviet Union. Uh, what country invaded Iran in 1941 uh, and he uh, kicked out its uh, reigning uh, uh, monarch? Uh, that was the Soviet Union together with Britain. So the, the Soviet Union was the bad guy in the neighborhood for years and years and was still the bad guy when uh, the clerics took over in 1979. Uh, but as many predicted, and I think uh, was to be expected, uh, it is hard to sustain a revolutionary fervor uh, when you have the responsibilities of state. Uh, governance can be uh, sobering. And uh, over time, uh, Iran's foreign policy took on a more pragmatic tinge. Uh, that's not to say it's the same old, you know, the, your average country, uh, but certainly uh, both in action uh, uh, if not in word, uh, its policy began to change. So that you had a uh, ascendance of what I would call pragmatism and uh, interest-based foreign policy. For example, uh, Iran has supported Armenia, Christian Armenia, uh, over uh, uh, Islamic Azerbaijan. It has formed an alliance with Syria, even though the Syrias, Assyrians are ruled by the Ba'athist party as Iraq, uh, Iran's traditional rival in the region, they have overlooked the fact that one is secular and one is religious in orientation to join because they have common interests. Uh, Hatami, uh, coming to power, talked about a dialogue of civilizations, uh, not a revolution, not exporting the revolution. Now, of course, he was followed by President Ahmadinejad, who has been uh, more confrontational, spoken more about rights than dialogue, uh, but we haven't seen Iran act out in the international system in the ways that it did earlier uh, soon after the revolution. And of course, then the question remains, and we'll talk about it in some depth, what about this period now after the 612 election? Again, in terms of sort of setting the scene, let me quickly touch on a couple of things, a couple of dimensions of foreign policy that I think are important if you're going to try to understand why Iran acts the way it does. And these are geography, ideology, religion, and culture, national interest, and psychology. I uh, won't spend too much time here, but it's always good to look at a map. When in doubt, look at a map. Uh, and if you look at Southwest Asia, which is what Iran, the region that Iran says it is in, it finds itself uh, in the center of this region. And you take a quick look around and you can see that they're sort of surrounded, at least from an Iranian point of view. They've got uh, Central Asia uh, on one side and they have uh, the Soviet Union and the Caucasus states on another side and Saudi Arabia down on the other side. Uh, Iranians like to tell the joke, what country has the second biggest border with the United States uh, next to Canada? Uh, they say it's Iran because there are U.S. troops in Iraq, there are uh, Turkey as a NATO ally, there are U.S. troops in Afghanistan, there are U.S. troops all around uh, the uh, border uh, uh, Iran. But in any case, Iran sees itself uh, both historically, uh, politically, and uh, uh, psychologically, if you will, as the center of this region. And unlike the U.S., which has two regions on it, uh, two oceans on its border and two benign allies on the other borders, Iran is surrounded by a number of states and uh, the Caucasus and the, uh, the stands are, have had their troubles in recent years. All right, the other factors that I pointed to, religion 
ideology, culture. You know, in the news media, these are the things that are seen as being definitive in Iranian uh, foreign policy, that the most important thing when it comes to understanding Iran is that it's an Islamic revolutionary country. Uh, and I do agree that Islam is an important factor, as is in particular Shiism. You often had talk, uh, heard talk, and you don't hear it much anymore, uh, but you often heard talk about the Shia crescent from Iranians, that uh, Iran was the center of a, uh, a group that expanded from one end of the globe to the other because of its uh, common Shia uh, religion, and anti-imperialism. And as I said, anti-imperialism uh, has uh, long been a mainstay in Iranian rhetoric, and again, understandably, it's been invaded several times by foreign countries. It's been the subject of foreign-inspired coups. Uh, the great powers have played there, and they've played there for oil and for influence, uh, whether it be uh, the Soviet Union or the United States. So it's not surprising that anti-imperialism, along with Shiism and Islam, are themes in Iranian rhetoric, uh, rhetoric. But that said, I think those factors tend to be overemphasized, at least uh, in comparison with the others, which is uh, one being national interest. Iran wants security. It wants external security and internal security. And right now, I think internal security uh, is the primary factor uh, that Iran, uh, that animates Iranian behavior. And economically, its main national interest is oil. And I think you will see Iran, like most states, pursuing policies that seek to enhance their ability to protect their own internal security, their external security, and their economic viability, in this case being oil. But there is also, I think, a psychological component as well. Uh, I think pride, national pride, uh, humiliation at being in, having been the subject of invasion, humiliation uh, at having been the, uh, subjected to foreign uh, intervention and coups, uh, plays no small role in how Iranians look at the world around them. And they, like the United States, uh, have a theory of exceptionalism. We say we're different from everyone else, that we're somehow a little better, uh, that we have a, a special purpose uh, in the international system that other countries, uh, the Dutch uh, or the Ugandans don't, that America is a special country. Well, the Iranians say the same thing about themselves. Uh, and I think uh, if you're trying to understand their reaction to the outside world, uh, understanding that pride and exceptionalism uh, are in play uh, is a useful guide. Let's talk about their goals, military goals. I see Iran, contrary to what you read in the paper, as a status quo power. That is to say, uh, they are not looking to invade a bunch of other countries. Iraq invaded Iran. Iran did not invade Iraq. Now, do they want to throw their weight around in the region? Absolutely. Do they want to be the regional hegemon politically? That is to say, have the most political influence over the other Gulf states to be recognized as the primary power in Southwest Asia, to enjoy the benefits that accrue from being the uh, top dog? Absolutely. Uh, are they going to invade a bunch of other countries? I don't think so. Uh, I think their defense, uh, their military capabilities are largely defensive in nature. They don't have much power projection. They don't have an air force. Uh, that can really do very much. They're building rockets, and they're trying to improve their rocket, uh, their missiles, uh, not only for the short term, but over the long term. Uh, but I see that more in terms of being able to retaliate against uh, uh, Israeli military strike or to deter an Israeli military strike or uh, military action by others. I don't see them initiating interstate wars. On the diplomatic side, and we saw a piece of this uh, just this past week uh, in Tehran at the Tehran Nuclear Conference, I think their main diplomatic goal is to try to counter the P5 plus 1's attempt to isolate, politically isolate Iran. Uh, the U.S. and its allies are working, beavering away at trying to say that uh, Iran is outside of the mainstream, that it should be sanctioned, uh, that it should be politically isolated, and Iran, not surprisingly, is responding, working as hard as they can uh, among the non-aligned movement countries and others, saying, no, we're uh, a normal country that's part uh, of the a global system that has relations with others. Economically, uh, I think, uh, you know, it's energy, 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 and in particular oil, and to some extent natural gas, but again, they don't have the, the wherewithal to take advantage of that uh, as much as they would like. Within the economic sphere, it's the Caspian Sea and the pipelines that most concern uh, their energy future. They need foreign investment in the energy sector. In absolute terms, they are pumping out less oil each year, less oil each year and in part because they lack the investment to try to maximize the wells that they have already, that they already have, and because 
uh, they don't have uh, the technology, foreign technology, foreign investment they would need uh, to explore their natural gas reserves and new oil wells. I've sat in meetings with Iranian officials who have said privately that they are concerned about their economic future. They are a young country. Some giant fraction of the population is under the age of 35. And uh, not a non-trivial uh, percentage of that are young people in their teens and 20s. And officials worry about providing jobs to those young people, those young men who constitute a overwhelming fraction of the population. And finally, and I think to the surprise of many, when talking about economic goals of Iran, uh, they want to be a member of the World Trade Organization and they want a Southwest Asia free trade zone. Now, for casual observers of Iran, you think, oh, well, they're sort of an authoritarian state and they're this revolutionary Islamic thing, so they must be for, uh, you know, sort of, they must be anti-free trade. And while I think Ahmadinejad is, has more of a populist status orientation, uh, the government policy is one in favor of expanding trade and having free trade. So you have sort of a semi-authoritarian state that is also pro-free trade. Now that's the background. Let's uh, get to it. And uh, here I want to talk about Iran prior to 612 in terms of their nuclear policy and what may be happening after that June election. First, the current status. Well, the DNI has said uh, that Iran could probably technically be capable of producing enough highly enriched uranium for a nuclear weapon sometime during the 2010-2015 time frame. Now this was from uh, testimony uh, given by the Director of National Intelligence. You've probably heard that we had a 2007 NIE that is subject to revision. There are rumors about a new NIE being released. That NIE may change a previous finding with respect to Iran's nuclear activities in the years after 2003. But I think this fundamental finding will probably remain. That is to say, uh, the intelligence community in the United States is judging in its public documents uh, that Iran has not made the decision to pursue a nuclear weapon, the decision to build a nuclear weapon. It's putting itself in a position where it has a capability, where it has an option to do so in the future if events warrant, but it hasn't crossed the line and made a political commitment to be a nuclear weapon state. So what we're talking about is a country that has some capability. Uh, they are not yet producing highly enriched uranium. They, you know, we can debate about what 20% means enrichment, but they don't have a level of enriched uranium in a quantity that would allow them to build a nuclear weapon at this point. Uh, and so this remains an open question so far. With respect to their nuclear ambitions, I think it's useful to think about the players and their motivations. And with Iran, there are multiple players. Uh, the supreme leader is the decider. There is no one more important than the supreme leader. There are other uh, actors that are important, but none more important than the supreme leader. There is a new theory that may suggest that the Revolutionary Guard uh, is ascendant and uh, the Supreme Leader is dependent on uh, the Guard after the 612 election, but at the end of the day, the leader is the leader, and that hasn't changed. Uh, the leader is said to have favor nuclear energy, to have the sort of 1970s view that nuclear energy, as opposed to nanotechnology or biotechnology or something like that, is a cutting edge technology that uh, you know, will pave the way to economic development. That's a 1970s idea, uh, but that is an idea that is, or a belief that is attributed to the Supreme Leader. Uh, the president, President Ahmadinejad, has used the nuclear issue uh, for his own internal uh, domestic political needs. He's used it as a, a nationalist card for, for the basis for political mobilization uh, and to expand his ability uh, to uh, pursue his own goals within the political arena within Iran, internal to Iran. And then there are other players uh, whose role is less clear. Uh, the Rev Iranian Revolutionary Guard, uh, IRGC, uh, the Atomic Energy Organization of Iran, the AEOI, the Iranian people. I put the Iranian people there. Remember, this is pre-612. This was the situation prior to 612. When we go into the next section, things will be a little different. But prior to uh, 612, I think uh, Iranian attitudes were important. Uh, the Supreme Leader was the leader, but he couldn't get too far out ahead of the people, and that, I think that was true of the Iranian government. Uh, but again, I think a lot of things have changed uh, over the past year, and we'll talk about that. But we. We don't really know much about these people here. There's lots of talk about the Revolutionary Guard. Everyone talks about the Revolutionary Guard. As far as I can tell, no one actually knows anything about the Revolutionary Guard. And uh, there doesn't seem to be much nuanced thinking about the Revolutionary Guard. Uh, it is said, for example, that the Revolutionary Guard 
uh, rank and file voted for Hatami. And there's some uh, uh, speculation that the IRGC rank and file voted for Mousavi. Yet the commanders clearly have been staunchly in support of the Supreme Leader. Are they divided? What's the relationship between the Revolutionary Guard, which is one military in Iran, and the regular military, which is a second military in Iran? It's like we, if the U.S. had two Pentagons. Uh, what's the nature of that relationship? Is it competitive? Is it uh, uh, contested? Is it collaborative? Very unclear. And we know very little about what's going on within the Atomic Energy Organization of Iran. Uh, I'm a student of nuclear organizations. I work on nuclear nonproliferation. That's, that's sort of my thing. And I find that the nuclear bureaucracy tends to be very important, a, a, a swing element uh, that can retard uh, a nuclear program or can accelerate a nuclear program. And we don't know much about uh, people there. Now, the head of that program, it was a program that drifted for years. You know, they've had this since the 1980s. It went nowhere. This has not been a fast-moving program by nuclear standards. But it began to make progress in the late 1990s, beginning in 1997, when uh, Mr. Agazeda took over. He was a Mousavi supporter and then resigned after the election. Now, are nuclear scientists who are highly educated and have a demographic, demographic profile that you would think would be associated with the reform movement, or at least with Mous uh, Mousavi's campaign, are they, you know, uh, anti-regime? Has that affected their work? Are, are there other things that are affecting their work? No one knows. So. I want to underline that for two of the institutions that are at the heart of the nuclear question in Iran, uh, no one in the West knows very much. And those who claim that they do, you should walk away from them as soon as possible. You, I would not you know, expose yourself to that. Uh, those are the players. Uh, what are the, some of the things involved here? Well, again, I think national pride is a big deal here. I don't think this is a security-driven program. We'll talk about that more in a second. I think it's national pride a desire for autonomy. This is a classic motivation among aspiring uh, nuclear states, whether it's civilian nuclear power or nuclear weapons. They want to be able to stand on their own. They don't want to have to depend on others. Uh, you get a lot of this from Argentina and Brazil early in their nuclear program. You hear it here. And I'm guessing there's a big dose of bureaucratic and domestic politics uh, that are making this program chug along. In contrast to a program that is purely driven by security concerns. You know, we think of nuclear programs as uh, they pursue them because they face a threat, and the way they deal with this threat, another nuclear threat or overwhelming conventional force, is to build a nuclear weapon. Uh, I don't think that's what's going on here. And I have a very complicated slide I'm not going to bore you with that sort of charts uh, Iran's threat environment and its nuclear program. And there's not a lot of correspondence. There's not, it doesn't move in parallel, as you would expect if security was really driving this. So I look at Iran's nuclear program, and I think of it more like the French program or the Indian program. These are programs that were driven by national pride and bureaucratic politics, not uh, uh, North Korea's program or Pakistan's program, which were clearly, at least in the early years, uh, driven more by security motivations. So for them, again, prior to 612, the nuclear, civilian nuclear program was a priority, but it wasn't their most important priority. It was something important to them, but it wasn't the most important thing. And what they were really seeking, Iran was seeking prior to 612, was recognition, they want to be recognized. This gets back to pride and what they think is their rightful place in Southwest Asia, and end to isolation and economic development. Domestically, the uh, nuclear program has proven to be quite popular. And it doesn't matter whether you're a reformer or a conservative uh, or an anti Ahmadinejad conservative or a pro Ahmadinejad conservative. People felt, uh, of course, they never even knew they had nuclear rights under the NPT, but once the program came out in 2003, suddenly this was the thing uh, that they felt they had a right to. And across the political board, there is general support for the nuclear program, not nuclear weapons, but a civilian nuclear program. In fact, there are very few advocates of an overt nuclear weapons status. You don't see that in the Iranian press, and you don't see that at all from Iranian spokespeople. There have been the occasional comment that by Rafsan Johnny in decades past, but in the main, what you hear instead, and again echoed at the most recent Iranian uh, conference in Tehran on the nuclear issue, is that nuclear weapons would violate the Quran, that nuclear weapons are incompatible. The production, stockpiling, or use of nuclear weapons is a haram, is a, a moral bad uh, to be rejected. Public opinion over time has become more pro-nuclear. If you looked at public opinion polls, and of course polling in Iran is difficult, what you saw is that everyone supported civilian nuclear power, a very small percentage 
supported a, a nuclear weapon. As this controversy has dragged on from 2001, 2002, 3, on and on, the number of Iranians, and I, we don't have good figures after 612, the number of Iranians who support an overt nuclear weapon status has increased as the controversy has, has gone on. Not a majority, still a majority opposed nuclear weapons among the Iranian population, but uh, there, I, one senses that there's a feeling that, well, if you're going to hassle us over our civilian nuclear program, then, you know, screw it, we're going to go ahead and build a bomb. You know, that's sort of on, on the part of an average Iranian. Uh, those who favor nuclear tend to be younger, maler, and less well-off, if you look at the demographics and, and peel those back. And the real question is not whether they should have a nuclear program, a civilian nuclear program. The disagreement within the Iranian system between pro Ahmadinejad conservatives and anti Ahmadinejad conservatives has been how to pursue that program. Should there be confrontation? It, does the tough line pay? This is Ahmadinejad's statement. Look, we had Hatami, he was a nice guy, smiling face. We got nothing. We got nothing from the West when Hatami was there. Uh, they just said he was a tool of, uh, of the leadership and ignored him. Uh, Ahmadinejad comes in, he gets tough, and he begins to do something, and, and uh, the program advances. That is Ahmadinejad's argument. And there, unfortunately, is something to that. But others also argue, and I think, again, there's something to this, uh, that the tough line obviously also inspires fear, concern in Arab states, concern in the rest of the world, and it results in costs being imposed on Iran. All right. Well, that was my sense of the Iranian nuclear issue prior to the June 12th election. Let's talk a little bit about what happened after the election. After the election, the WHO in Iranian foreign policy has changed. Now, that's my old slide. That's the slide I used to have. But uh, I've changed it. The president still clearly has a say. And in fact, the president arguably has a greater say uh, in nuclear policy today than at any point, although it is contested. And I'll get back to that. There's the Supreme National Security Council. That's sort of the senior organ uh, that sets nuclear policy. And certainly, that was true prior to 612. I am told that after 612, uh, that group does not all meet together. Uh, it meets in rump session. Uh, some of the members are excluded from the meetings because they're associated with the Russ on Johnny camp or with uh, others who uh, feel uncomfortable uh, uh, with the new regime. The Supreme Leader clearly is uh, a player as is the IRGC. It's what everyone says, so you know maybe it's true. Uh, but uh, uh, presumably they are a player in some regards. The Montleys, uh, less of a player, uh, less willing to challenge Ahmadinejad openly. Larry jo Johnny still does, but uh, Ahmadinejad had no problem getting his full uh, cabinet appointed this last time when he had a bunch of problems previously. In part, again, I'm guessing because there's a sense of we need to pull together and consolidate after a domestic political crisis. And then there's public and elite opinion, which I think was important prior to 612, I don't think it's as important now. So what you have here is a shrinking uh, base of governance. Fewer actors, uh, fewer constituencies being represented. Let's talk about the June election for a minute. Uh, there's no smoking gun here. But if you ask me, I think it's highly, highly, highly unlikely uh, that Ahmadinejad would have won an outright 63, 62% of the vote in a high turnout election. He did well against Rafsanjani in 2005 in the general election because it was a low turnout election. Uh, the notion that, uh, you know, under not economically difficult times, but certainly not uh, robust economic times, when there was a mobilized opposition and a consolidated opposition, that he would do better this time around seems unlikely. Uh, I think, and I think most close observers of Iran thought that he was going to win anyway that he was going to win, the, there was going to be a runoff, there was going to be him and Mousavi in a runoff, and then he would win the general election after the runoff, uh, I mean, he would win the runoff after the primary uh, because he would have the apparatus of the state, he'd be able to turn out his own people, and, you know, and there'd be playing at the margins with the votes, and he'd be declared the winner. So the idea that he won without even had, having to go to a runoff, that was the shocker, uh, not that he might have won. Uh, the real shocker, obviously, though, is that the disputed election called in the, uh, into question the legitimacy of the supreme leader and that you have division within the leadership class. This isn't the reformers against the uh, establishment conservatives. 
This is establishment figures like Rafsan Johnny, like Mousavi, against the Supreme Leader. At least that's, you know, the Supreme Leader would say that. And it's conservatives against Ahmadinejad. It's not just reformers against Ahmadinejad. The conservative camp is split between establishment people who supported Mousavi and who lost, and then separately, in addition to that, within the conservative group that won a division between the pro ahmadinejad faction and the anti ahmadinejad faction, the latter most often associated with Ali Larajani, who's head of their uh, parliament, the Majlis. So after 612, well, I think, you know, we talked about what the goals of the Iranian state were prior to 612. After 612, I think the main goal is survival of the revolution. And foreign policy is foreign policy for the sake of supporting domestic policy. It is an instrument for domestic policy, for maintaining governance. You have changing leadership. You have a changing decision process. Remember, I talked about a shrinking of the actors and the institutions that are able to uh, be involved. And you have a new set of incentives. And I'm going to be uh, talking about that. And then uh, here's something that most of you may not be aware of, or, or it, it says something about Ahmadinejad and it says something about the new era we're in. If you had read the newspapers from 2005 on, you would think that uh, Ahmadinejad was ideologically, irrevocably committed to standing against the US and not negotiating. And that it was the reformers or the establishment types, the pragmatic conservatives, associated with the Rouhani and Rafsanjani camp that were pro-negotiation. But in October of last year, we had a proposal, the Tehran Research Reactor deal, which would have, to some extent, legitimized enrichment in Iran. That was a big compromise on uh, the US and the P5-plus-1's part. But on the other hand, uh, would have uh, taken uranium, low enriched uranium, out of the country. They would have been shipped abroad and therefore not around to be used, to be enriched, to make highly enriched uranium. So this was a win-win deal. So who was the Iranian advocate for this negotiated compromise, this win-win deal between uh, the West and uh, Iran? It was Ahmadinejad. He was the main advocate of that deal. And when the deal got back to Iran, back to Tehran, who opposed the deal? The reformers. Mousavi attacked the deal, saying uh, Ahmadinejad sold out Iranian interests. And the anti Ahmadinejad conservatives, Mr. Larajani among them, attacked the deal as selling out Iranian self interest. So the guy, the demon that we all know uh, through the newspapers, was the guy who was pro negotiated settlement. And when he took that plan back to Tehran, he was attacked on the right and the left. And then the plan stalled. So again, that gives you a flavor of the complexity and, and the difficulties of uh, trying to advance a negotiated settlement when there is so much infighting within the state. So this is a very emotional issue and a very personal issue. But I think the, the emotional and the personal has overwhelmed our ability to analyze the prospects for Iran's political future. In the first few days uh, or weeks after the election, the view was, uh, you know, the reform movement's going to take over, not the reform movement. Mousavi, the opposition, is going to win. And they're going to supplant the government. Uh, you know, it's a bright new day in which uh, Iran will be ruled under a different uh, group. And that sort of uh, uh, unjustified optimism was then met with an unjustified pessimism. We went from one extreme to the other uh, when, after the, uh, the protest movement did not generate a lot of protesters on the streets, at least not to the level that uh, Westerners could see or that was comparable to the early days of the, after the election. Everyone said, oh, all is lost. You know, the reform movement's dead. There's nothing that can be done. And I think this really is thinking with your heart, not uh, with your brain. I think it's highly uncertain what is going to happen. Uh, and I don't think the Iranians themselves know what's going to happen. And that these are processes that often work in ways that uh, are difficult to predict. You know, if you look at Iranian history, there are a number of scenarios, and that's why I have the slide. I think it's just worth reminding ourselves uh, that it's not just one possible outcome. It's not just two possible outcomes. There's a lot of play in the system here. And there are other, other uh, unexpected events, in addition to the ones we have already seen, that might still be in the offing. You know, at the end of the day, you bet that the guys with the guns are going to maintain power. I mean, that's the easy bet, and I think, you know, most times that's the bet that's going to win. But it doesn't always work out that way. Uh, 
the Supreme Leader and the Revolutionary Guard can continue to govern with a narrow base. That's one option. The Supreme Leader could reach out in a coalition government, try to bring Rafsanjani types, or maybe one level down, he may be out, but one level down into a government and invite them back and say, all is forgiven, oh, let's move forward. Uh, Ahmadinejad could be impeached. You know, that Majlis, if something were to happen, uh, they could go after him. They wanted to go after him before, uh, and they didn't do it. Uh, the opposition could be arrested. The opposition could be assassinated. Assassination is, a, uh, unfortunately, a uh, common feature of Iranian political history. And I remember hearing a report on the radio where the, uh, uh, one of the security services said that they had just uh, interfered or, uh, with a plot by the MEK to assassinate Mousavi. And you know, I thought, this is interesting. The MEK that's committed to defeating the Iranian government, they were going to assassinate not the Supreme Leader, not uh, the President. They, were gonna, they were, had a plot to assassinate uh, uh, Mousavi, the uh, leader of the opposition. I interpreted that as a uh, not too subtle threat against Mousavi and that group, that they may be subject to assassination. Uh, so, you know, we could have that. As a supreme leader, he's, he's no spring chicken. You know, he could die. And then where would we be? Uh, we could have a, you know, some people talk about a military coup, a de facto military coup by the IRGC. Uh, the nuclear program could take a dive. What happens if all those nuclear guys are Mousavi supporters? Uh, there could be a push for an overt weapon status, which would re represent a dramatic break from past Iranian nuclear policy. So, you know, there are a lot of things here. Are they all equally probable? No. But I think just listing them at least should give us a sense that we shouldn't be overly confident in predicting that things are going to turn out one way or another. There's lots of uncertainty here, and the Iranians themselves are uncertain about what will happen. Let's shift to U.S. policy. Here are some of the players. Some of them may be recognizable. Obama's Iran policy, uh, it's been pretty clear, but it has been evolving. I think it's evident that the president has a preference for better relations with Iran. Uh, he has a policy of keeping open the prospect of dialogue and negotiation, despite political pressure at home from Republicans and others, uh, uh, and pressure groups uh, that uh, don't want any rapprochement with Iran. And I would include that also other uh, allies. The, the last thing the Arabs want to see or the Israelis want to see is somehow a, uh, a, uh, a better relations between the U.S. and Iran. Because in a zero-sum game, if that's the way you look at the world, uh, they lose out on that. So the, one of the few things the Arab states and the Israelis have in common is they both agree that the U.S. should not have good relations with Iran. But despite the domestic political pressure and the foreign political pressure, the president has been fairly uh, uh, consistent and disciplined in uh, pursuing negotiation. And in particular, you think about that Tehran Research Reactor deal that I referred to earlier. That happened in October, the October that followed the June election. So despite the June election, despite the protests, the violence, and everything that happened, the president still maintained the policy to keep open the, uh, uh, the communication and the possibility of a negotiated solution. But I think things are you know, you get a sense that things are slipping away. Uh, certainly, there were divisions within the administration. I've met with almost all the senior officials involved in, in the U.S. and Iranian policy. Uh, there was always a skepticism and, and wariness on the part of some. Some American officials have a religious belief that you can't trust Iran no matter what, and that may be the case, but it's not always good to walk in with that as your preconception. Uh, and clearly, the events that have happened since have strengthened that camp. So. There is a stated willingness on the part of the U.S. to engage Iran where we have common interests, in Afghanistan, against the drug trade, in favor of a stable Iraq. Uh, but uh, despite those statements, there doesn't seem to be much progress. Now, it's understandable uh, that there may not have been much progress. You could argue that the main obstacle to negotiation has been Tehran. Uh, that the Supreme Leader remains skeptical about the U.S., skeptical about improved U.S.-Iranian relations, that they have a domestic political crisis, for God's sake. I mean, in the U.S., when we have an election year, we all accept the fact that because it's a presidential election year, we're not going to get anything done. No major decisions will be made because it's election year. Well, they just had a political meltdown that makes, uh, you know, an election year look like uh, playing checkers. But uh, we expect them, despite the fact that they're fighting for their political lives and battling each other intensely every day, 
We expect them to make dramatic commitments uh, that are different from their past policy and that are risky from where uh, they're, they're staying. You know, most countries, most governments under siege, they don't engage in a lot of risky behavior. They tend to pull back, be conservative, uh, and try to wait it out. So to me, it, it's not shocking that in the wake of a near political meltdown, you don't see a lot of risk taking in, in Iranian foreign policy. Uh, and you could argue that Obama has made clear steps to engage Iran. So I think there's a strong case that Obama has tried to engage Iran, uh, and as my friends in the government say, you know, no one's picking up the phone on the other end. We want to talk to them, no one's going to pick them up. I have to say, in all honesty, though, after having recently gone through a round of meetings with the U.S. and a round of meetings with U.S. Uh, high-ranking Iranian officials, I think that's probably right, but it's not the whole story. Uh, the U.S. government is divided on this. As I said, some have a religious, near religious faith about Iran's intentions and willingness to be uh, a negotiating partner. And clearly the public rhetoric has changed. I mean, you can close your eyes and you think you're in the previous administration when you hear the things that are being said today. And when you talk to officials and you ask them some questions, they say they want to talk to people and then you respond and say, well, why don't you do X? They give answers that are not, um, that don't give you a lot of confidence. So while I continue to believe that the main obstacle to progress in some sort of negotiation is probably in Tehran, I think things may be changing here in a way that may not be helpful. But in any case, I can tell you from talking to uh, high-ranking officials on both sides, they both claim they want to negotiate. They both claim it's the other guy who won't talk to me. And it's very, very odd conversation to sit in, I assure you. Now, whatever Obama is trying to do or not trying to do, here's what I take to be the Washington narrative outside the White House. The Washington narrative is Obama had a strategy of negotiation. That strategy clearly failed. And now we have to get tough with sanctions. But of course, sanctions aren't going to work. And even the administration will tell you that. Sanctions aren't going to work. And so some say, well, we need a military strike. And others say, well, a military strike is too costly. We, we should have containment. But of course, in containment means they get to have a nuclear weapon or do whatever they're going to do. It doesn't change the fundamental outcome. And so then those people who are unhappy with containment, they're now putting their chips on the, remove, uh, the reform movement. That that will save the day. Well, I don't think any of these is very strong. But what I want to take issue with is number two. You know, what is failure? The uh, Common wisdom is that negotiation has failed, uh, and that's why we have to give up and do these other things. I analogize it to, uh, let's say you and I, this woman in the front row here. What's your name? Diane. Diane. Diane, you and I have problems. We have things that we disagree about. And you and I are going to go, and we're going to meet at a local restaurant uh, to try to hash these things out. And you get in your car, and I get in my car, and we drive to this restaurant. But you have a car accident. And you're taken to the hospital. And you're in a coma, sitting in the bed. And I say, well, I have a strategy of negotiation and positive incentives. And I go in there, and you're sitting in the coma, and I say, well, let's negotiate. And I will offer you all these things. And you don't respond. And I said, oh, well, that's obviously failed. So I say, well, maybe if I get tough, she'll respond. And so I start threatening you. But you're in a coma, so you don't respond. I said, well, geez, that, that hasn't worked either. That must have failed. Uh, so, you know, maybe if I. Uh, try to get her fired, or I uh, slap her around a little. Maybe uh, she'll uh, do what I want her to do, but she's in a damn coma, and she won't respond. Uh, so I, I guess what I would question is, what do we mean by failure? Is it that th we've tried negotiation, and the Iranians have made a decision that they are fundamentally opposed to negotiation, and have responded to it, and been in a position to respond to it? right after uh, the biggest political meltdown since 1979. I don't know. I, 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 I doubt that characterization. The future. Well, I believe that an Iran with nuclear weapons is not inevitable. Everyone says that, particularly the people who are pro-military strike. They're all talking about how it's inevitable that Iran will get nuclear weapons. Well, I think that doesn't, as an academic, if you look at the history of the nuclear age, that's simply not the case since the 1940s and in every subsequent decade. Uh, 
40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, we have consistently overestimated the rate at which uh, nuclear weapons would spread. If you read the papers, you'd never know that the rate of proliferation has actually declined over time. It peaked in the 1960s. We have uh, fewer nuclear, fewer countries, even if we name all the ones we think might be trying to get nuclear weapons, there are fewer countries trying to get nuclear weapons today than at any decade in the nuclear age. Most countries that started down the path towards nuclear weapons, we have you know, nine, ten nuclear weapon states, depending on how you count the ones that gave them up, like South Africa, nine or ten nuclear weapon states. But there were an additional 20 states that had an interest in nuclear weapons that started down that path, who stopped and reversed course. It, it's not the nuclear age, it's the non-nuclear age, the overwhelming preponderance of countries who had an interest in nuclear weapons and started down that path, stopped and reversed course. So uh, Iran may get nuclear weapons, but it would be a mistake indeed to assume that it would get nuclear weapons, and that would contradict our historical understanding. And again, uh, the NIE, and I expect it to be reaffirmed, although I have no insider knowledge of this, uh, that uh, in the last NIE anyway, it said that Iran has yet to make a political decision to become an overt nuclear weapon state, or at least to build nuclear weapons. And of course, that's, that may change. And it seems to me 612 provides incentives that move in different directions. On the one hand, if you've got problems at home, it should give you an incentive to want to settle up with the uh, international community so that, you know, you can focus on your problems at home. So maybe, you know, this, all this business gives Iran a reason to want to get the nuclear monkey off their back uh, so that they can deal with one problem, the most important problem, which is their domestic problem. I'm afraid, though, and this is purely speculative, that it also provides other incentives. If you have suffered a loss of legitimacy at home, and you have suffered a loss of legitimacy abroad, then one way to try to recoup that legitimacy, and I don't advocate it, but one way to do that is to become a nuclear weapon state, to change the subject and to thrust yourself into the limelight as a country that has accomplished something that other states have not. Pakistan's original interest in nuclear weapons was not for this. It was, I think, security driven. It feared the Indian, what I consider provocative behavior on the part of uh, India. But once uh, Pakistan developed a bomb, it took a life of its own. It became a source of domestic pride. It became a card that politicians played to shore up their own domestic standing, particularly in a country that had legitimacy issues. I have concerns that we, there may be incentives now, after a loss of legitimacy, that may give Iran reasons to want a nuclear weapon. Now, that's not the most likely scenario, but that sort of shows that there are cross-cutting dynamics here. As I said, at the end of the day, most states fail to become nuclear weapon states. Most that try fail, and most fail because the process gets extended. The time horizon is expanded. So how do you expand that time horizon? How do we ex expand the time horizon and increase the likelihood that this program will end up on the shoals like most of the other programs in the nuclear age? Well, you can try military action. That will delay a program. There's no doubt about it. But it also has the paradoxical effect, at least historically speaking, of giving a program a focus. Well, when we bombed uh, Iraq's Osirak reactor, uh, both Israeli analysts and our own nuclear, I mean, Iraqi study group concluded that after that attack, Saddam made their nuclear program job one, priority one. Prior to that, it was, you know, he had this program and that program, the nuclear program was one of these things going on. After the bombing, he released senior nuclear scientists from prisons. It became job one, and he focused on it. For Iran, a proud country that has had a public commitment to nuclear, civilian nuclear, if we bomb that program, I think there's a very good chance that that helps uh, uh, seal the deal in terms of them becoming a nuclear weapon state. Maybe not tomorrow, but later on. So you get some short-term delay but you add a tremendous political incentive to becoming a nuclear weapon state. Now, the other way to delay the program is through negotiation, because that requires that they engage in greater transparency and cooperation. Now, some people say, well, then you're just helping Iran because they're playing for time. You hear this all the time. Don't negotiate with Iran because it, they're just playing us for time. Uh, that is a misapplication uh, of a concept. Playing for time is when I get to do something I normally wouldn't be able to do, but because we're in negotiations, I can do it. 
until the negotiations end. Iran currently is enriching. It is enriching, and that's what we're trying to stop. It will enrich, it is enriching prior to any negotiation. It will enrich during negotiations. Uh, you know, it might enrich after negotiation. Not, nothing changes because we're negotiating. They're not getting something extra for the fact that there are negotiations. If we aren't negotiating, they will be enriching anyway. So I don't think the playing for time argument really applies. Some, I don't know why these arguments get invoked when they clearly don't apply, but I think that's not the case here. Now, I think negotiations are likely to be difficult. There are internal divisions, and there's politics in both countries. And I, we saw what happened with the Tehran research reactor deal. But I don't have faith in sanctions, and I don't have, I fear a military strike will make Iran a nuclear weapons state. And I think negotiation is probably the least bad alternative for trying to achieve our goals here. And with that, I will stop. Thank you very much.